If you're broke and have no money, then you really only have one of probably two or three options. Is either partner with someone that isn't broke and does have money, and you do that one of probably two ways. But you're still making really good money and you're doing it relatively quickly. Are you ready to transform your life? This is a no-nonsense show helping immigrants like you create generational wealth, even while working full-time. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Socket Jane. My great to us listeners, if you want to manage real estate, maybe you're ready for a lifestyle change. By selling your real estate, of course, you may have to pay substantial cap and gain taxes. One option that may help solve this is to learn about doing a 1031 tax deferred real estate exchange. Because you may be able to defer all of the capital gain taxes, and you could even exchange into a replacement property that may allow you to get rid of all of the headaches involved with being an active landlord. Ray DeWitt is a managing director with Bangtanger Financial Services, and his goal is to help you understand all the rules associated with the 1031 exchanges. To learn more, visit their website at bangtangerfinancials.com and browse the library of education material. Please be sure to see the disclosures and show notes. Welcome back, my great to wealth listeners. Today, we're going to be talking to TJ Kosen. TJ, how are you, buddy? Doing good. Looking forward to the conversation. Yes, yeah, same here. I think if we continue talking, I know we were talking off air for over 20 minutes. And if we continue talking, I think we would not have a podcast episode. So we thought that, you know what, might as well hit record and continue the conversation. That seemed like a good idea to us. Yeah. So TJ, help us understand, man. Actually, you know what, let's take a step back. I always want to start the show with, when you hear the term migrate to wealth, what does wealth mean to you? I think it's buying back your time. I really do. I think money is probably one of the most abundant resources in human history, mankind, any of that stuff. And so many people don't understand that. I think it's really the ability to buy back your time and do what you want to with your time. You can always make more money. You can never make more time. Correct. Correct. So now help us understand your journey into that wealth of how you got to buy your time back, especially moving from California, San Diego. I'm just trying to, I'm I'm just trying to figure it out, man. I'm just trying to figure it out. I don't know. Um, (laughs) So long story is got into real estate in 2006 before the crash. Lost the money yeah. in the crash that you and I talked about a little bit before the show. That was a lot of fun, a lot of stress. The biggest keys for actually like scaling up, because we do a pretty high volume. We do distressed residential right now is our primary like core competency. And what really allowed us to scale up and do a volume where I'm not talking to sellers, I'm not talking to buyers. I'm very active in the business and I'm very active in especially the construction and that kind of stuff because I kind of enjoy it. But what really allowed us to really maximize on that was by starting to invest in people even the systems and processes things, just investing in people that are able to do the job that needs to get done, empowering them. And then I almost want to say, I say a lot of the times, just kind of dropping the ball here and there because knowing that your team is going to pick it up and do what needs to get done. And then keep track of things. You track everything, obviously track all the metrics, track all that stuff. But the people aspect of the business is so hard to understand when you're a solopreneur and you think you have to do every piece of it. I know people that drop off buckets of paint and negotiate acquisition contracts. Like, oh my God. Yeah, I've done it. But it's not the way to buy back your time. It's the way to buy yourself a very well-paid job. And that's awesome. But it's not the way to get more time in your life. Yeah. So let's actually take a few steps back, right? So how did you get into what you're doing right now? Like, what did you always want to be in real estate? Did you have an exposure into real mm-hmm. estate? And this, I think you mentioned, and if I heard you correctly, it's 2006 is when you really started. Was yeah. it the heat at the moment because everyone else was doing it? So might as well. What got you going with that? What was the reason? I think I always wanted to do real estate. I don't tell the story too much on podcasts because it doesn't come up. When I was nine, my great grandma was in real estate in San Diego years ago. No particular benefit to me. So it's not one of those kind of situations. But I remember my grandma was selling a building in downtown San Diego in the mid 80s. And across the street was a high rise, 100% vacant, but an old hotel building called the El Cortez Hotel. And I remember turning to my mom and I'm six or seven, whatever I was. Said, hey, what's up with that building? She tells me, oh, it's an old hotel. It's vacant. No one's doing anything with it. And I'm sitting there scratching my head going like, well, is anyone going to buy it and fix it? She says, oh, I don't know. Probably not. Because it was downtown San Diego in the 80s was a little uh, rough, to be honest with you. It wasn't always revitalized the way it is now. And I'm sitting there as this little kid, not knowing any better, complete idiot, obviously, very naive and kind of arrogant, saying, you know, we should instead of selling this, because this is pretty cool. It wasn't that cool. We should probably be buying that instead. And, Mm. you know, that's cute when you're eight. But it always kind of stuck with me because knowing the properties and knowing the neighborhood and then growing up, going to high school, going to college actually in San Diego and seeing what happened to downtown, what happened to development. So, you know, it seems to me like the easiest way to make the most money with least work is to probably get into real estate. So that's the first part of the 
uh, answer. Then it comes to the painful part. Did I get in in 2006 because it was trendy? Probably part yeah. of that and part because I had graduated college in 05. Took a couple months off to visit a buddy of mine, help him work on his house, and then did loans for a while and thought, you know, loans are kind of lame. There's a lot of sales aspect, a lot of, uh, a lot of like... When you say you did loans, like, well, were you a mortgage broker or in the mortgage yeah, lending so business? Yeah, I was a loan officer. Got it. Yeah, loan Got officer it. before the crash. So I saw a lot of the stuff that was kind of in the pipeline just from a, what the products were available at the time. And again, I was growing up in San Diego. <laughs> we're more accustomed to large swings in the marketplace, right. just being coastal and residential. Like I remember the crash in the 80s, probably about the time that they... Actually, uh, my grandma sold that stuff like before that crash in the 80s. I remember a mini crash in the 90s. I remember a little blip in the early 2000s. So yeah. we're always a little bit more conscious of like big swings in the marketplace growing up there. So seeing these loans, like, man, these loans are going to hit and they're going to hit California bad and they're going to hit Florida bad. Well, let's do something sensible, like go to the Midwest or the Southwest-ish, mm -hmm. Southeast. Buy stuff there because it's more cash flow, more stable. And I didn't see any kind of drastic great recession coming or anything like that i don't think yeah. it just seemed like it made a lot of sense at the time turns out the entire banking industry collapsed and failed and that screwed a lot of people and uh i was in the middle of that so that was fun oh <laughs> man so tj now and you're still in real estate correct so let's take that journey forward so you're in 2008 2009 time frame where crap's hitting the fan and now you're trying to figure out how to get out of it right that's one of course you mm -hmm. need to figure that out mm -hmm. what made you stay in real estate well I don't think I necessarily believe in the sunk cost fallacy because of yeah. the piece of it. So I figured, well, shoot, I've spent all this time. We had a big team, property managers, maintenance guys, contractors. We probably had 50 guys working for us at different points in the construction process because we bought two properties, 112 units and 98 units. The first one was a big value add property. So it's kind of cool. You're on top of the world. You're 25, you're 26, you're in charge mm -hmm. of all this stuff. You're making things happen. And when everything crashes and burns, you want that high again. You want to get back into it. And the best way to do that is to realize like, no, there's a lot of good skills here that I learned from deal anal analytics, from right. management, from employment, from just, you know, the whole thing. It would be kind of silly not to, I mean, there's still potential in real estate, right? So there's, it'd be right. kind of silly to trade all that in to go get a corporate job. Plus, I don't know, time clocks weird me out. <laughs> so yeah. went back to California, licked my wounds for a couple of years, bought and sold a bunch of flips out there, bought a couple of properties for really dirt cheap. Been kind of doing that ever since, I guess. Got it. So now let's go into what do you do now? What's kind of help us understand where your focus is? Why did you pick that focus? So our main business is distressed residential, direct to seller acquisitions. And then from the acquisition standpoint, then we'll figure out, okay, based on what the seller needs, and they always think they need money. They generally need something besides money. But based on what the seller fundamentally needs, where does this property fit in our dispo ability and strategy where we can monetize on it. Mm -hmm. And from there, we take the lead and we kind of walk it through the process. So we do a pretty high volume of that business, all distressed residential, all direct to seller marketing. So we spend a bunch of money on Google PPC, on mailers, on cold calling, the whole thing. And it pays off well. Our ROAS, so return on ad spend, is significantly above the industry standard because we couple the dispo strategy with the acquisition strategy when we're looking at the deal. And then because we realize that for the most part, the sellers are not as money conscious as our competition thinks they are, to be honest with you. A lot of them, they just want to buy it for the contract, get it under contract with an option, see what they can do, and then dispo it for a small fee. We'll do that if we have to, but we would much rather have a conversation with the seller. Okay, what do you want time frame wise yeah. lease-back-wise? What's the deal here? What's the actual deal? And then we'll cater that to fit the property. And I've been doing that for years. Now, training a team that's kind of strictly wholesale based or wholesale mindset, how mm -hmm. to do that is definitely a struggle, but they're really good at it. We have guys that have been doing it as long as I am, my business partner over there, like really taking lead on training them how to do that because it's a definitely a different skill set. And like I said before, I think we have, I don't even know, 35 deals going at any given time in the contract yeah. process. So again, that's kind of how it looks right now. We got nine people in office and everyone kind of stays in their lane and does their job. Yeah. That's awesome. So TJ, let's peel this a little bit further, right? So when we say distressed assets, what does that really mean? Because distressed asset, I know what it means because I'm in this business. But when people hear distressed asset, I remember going back 20 years now, when I heard the word distress, that equated to me as problem, right? Well, they all have, problems. A, they all have problems, don't they? <laughs> they do, right? We all have problems, don't we? When I say problem, is more about 
shooting, prostitution, meth labs, right? That's where my mind used to go. But of course, since then I have changed my perspective. But since you're here on the show here, what does a distressed asset mean? And how do you qualify for one? How would you qualify an asset being distressed? Maybe it's a distinction between what's the actual stressing point. Our biggest mm-hmm. deal on the board right now is a property that we bought for 380 ish We're putting 400 into it, and it's already pre-sold for a million bucks. Mm-hmm. It was a fire damage house where the top was gone. So it runs the gamut. So it's definitely not just hood houses. Like I think that's kind of a piece of it. Right. The distress is the asset always once you acquire it, because now, now I'm distressed because now I own the asset. Now I got to figure out what I'm going to do with it. But from the acquisition standpoint, the distress is always on the seller. What's the seller's stressing position? What's stressing the seller out about this deal? And sometimes it's the house, sometimes it's an airship issue, sometimes it's a family issue, sometimes it's something else entirely, sometimes it's capacity. It doesn't really matter. And that's what the actual stress is. So then I like to say, at least in in our markets in Texas and Florida too, but for the most part, we're heavy in Texas. Neighborhood doesn't matter. For the right price, you can move anything. Now, if you buy it wrong, then you can't move it. So make sure you buy better. But we'll buy stuff. I've had people threaten to shoot me and kill me. It's been a couple of years since I don't really go on acquisition appointments anymore, but that's nice. been a while. And actually after leaving this, because I like the construction side, I'm talking to the buyers of that million dollar house because they're picking out granite. Again, it's 10 minutes that way. I kind of want to see the house and talk to the buyers. So it's really like distress is really individually specific to the asset. And I think you probably know that obviously in commercial yeah. space, it's really the same in residential. I always ask the question, right? What is your thesis on why are distressed sellers do they not know the value of their property? Do they not have the cash? What is going on in their situation where, and do you feel like, I know there's a lot of questions in there because it's all combined and I want to make sure to see if we can address it all together as one bucket instead of me asking multiple questions. The key question is, why is somebody selling you, I'm going to make up a number, 30 cents on a dollar, right? 70% discount. And I don't know if that's the right number or not. To the extent you're willing to share, I would love to see what your going in numbers are usually. If you think the after repair value is a million, would you buy it for mm-hmm. 300K? Would you buy it for 200K? At what point do you start seeing that it's not worth even looking at? A lot to unpack for sure. First of all, it's never, almost never, the seller not knowing what the property is worth on the retail market. Because, I mean, they can pull up Redfin, they can pull up Zillow, and yeah. you'll have sellers that say, oh, Zillow says this, like, well, Zillow's a liar. So you go through an education process. But if anything, it's bringing sellers that have an inflated opinion of their value down to a reality bill right. based on the condition of the property. And sometimes it depends a lot on the seller. Sometimes it's some tough love. Sometimes it's looking at competing offers and picking the other offers apart. Sometimes it's money isn't really a factor. And generally, like I said, money is very seldom the actual technically motivating factor. Mm-hmm. So our job on the acquisition side is to find out what do these sellers actually want? Do they want to sell this house so they can buy another house? Well, then they need their cash, but then they're not going to be able to close on their other house until they get their cash. And then they're going to want to lease back to move. Correct. Okay. Well, there's a cost for that. There's a cost associated with these different aspects of it. And we'll very often 100% honest with them saying, you know, as is our opinion is you can put it on the market for this price range and you'll probably get offers, but we don't know what the offers are going to be. You don't know when the closing timeframe is going to be. And once they do the inspections, they're going to find all the stuff that you just showed me that's wrong with your house because you're an honest person yeah. and I'm good at my job. And then they're going to ask for a lot of stuff. So do you want to go through that repair process? And if the answer is yes, then maybe we pursue a different dispo strategy. Maybe we pursue a listing strategy. Maybe we pursue a novation where we list it with, it's basically basically listing it and then we do the repairs for them depending on the circumstances of the house. So it really is fundamentally, I want to say it's seller driven in terms of what they actually need, but we steer the ship to figure out, to get there, to figure it out. Got it. And TJ, given the economy right now, the whole turmoil that's happening in the capital markets and at the macro level in general, what are you seeing? Is the, has the distressed situation accelerated? Are a lot of people are getting in that situation because either they bought too much of a house or they're too expensive as a house or now mm-hmm. the interest rates are very high? What are you seeing in the market right now? So what we're seeing, we're still seeing a very competitive marketplace on the retail side. We saw a slowdown Q3 and Q4 last year. And we saw that coming about six months in advance with the rate rising going up. We knew that would drive uncertainty in the marketplace. To be honest, I thought it would drive more uncertainty than it actually did. And then what we're seeing, again, the reason we're still seeing a very competitive retail market on the fixed up property side, I think, is because we're going to continue to see lower inventory than normal because everyone with 3% loan, if they want to upgrade, 
I mean, myself included, kind of, right? Yeah. If they want to upgrade, they want to buy a different house, they want to go somewhere else, they're scratching right. their head going like, I don't want to quadruple my payment for a house right. that's 2,000 square feet bigger because I have to now get a 6% rate instead of a 3.5% right. rate. Correct. So I don't think we're going to see a big influx of distressed sellers from that perspective. We're definitely not going to see a 2008 thing. I think fundamentally, the loans in the marketplace are good. I think it's the lenders. We saw it in non-QM. I think we're going to see it some in commercial. I think a lot of lenders wrote product that was not in their best interest. We saw that with the bank mm -hmm. failures, where yeah. there wasn't so much the real estate loans that were the issue. You can't buy long-term securities on short-term debt. So when we saw a year and a half ago, a lot of the non-QM secondary market refi for rental properties, residential rental properties go under, they're basically, they had their lines of credit, their lines of credit are here, and they are trading on a bond for 30-year fixed rates when they originate the deal. And they got a pool of bond before they can sell it. And the problem is if they're still pulling a bond and rates are going up like this and they're not adjusting their rates because their line of credit is still good, well, now they're yeah. going to get into a liquidity problem. I mean, that's going to affect office. It's going to affect commercial some. On the residential side, we are seeing an uptick on distressed residential sellers that are now having some of the more traditional pain points. So for probably a year and a half during COVID, we didn't have a single pre-foreclosure lead you wouldn't expect to. And now yeah. probably 15 to 20% of our leads, at least on the inbound side, are some sort of pre-foreclosure or you know situation like that. That's an uptick. It's not a flood. It's not right. a wave. And we're seeing so much more equity in the marketplace now than we did in 2010, 11, 12, that sellers have options. Very seldom do right. we have a situation where the seller doesn't have options. And if I'm a distressed seller at this point, what are my options? Oh, for sure. And that's how we couple the acquisition with the dispo strategy. So say that you're typing online, I want to sell my house fast, cash, you know, whatever. My ad yeah. pops up, you click on it. My team calls you in probably 30 to 45 seconds after you're done clicking because that's, amazing. that's their job. They should be probably better if they don't they get yelled at. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to test that so, with you know, TJ. Hey, don't, don't be running on my ad budget. That stuff's expensive. So you always have traditional listing and it's got all the benefits and disadvantages of it. The MLS is absolutely the biggest buyer pool in the world. Yeah. It's not necessarily the best, but you have MLS traditional listing and we'll walk through that product. Obviously, we try not to use that because honestly, it's not very often in the seller's actual best interest if it's a distressed seller especially right. if they're up against the time frame. We beat up seller expectations on listing with short sales all the time because uh, not with short sales, with pre foreclosures all the time. Because if you're up against the hard deadline and you're not necessarily motivated, that's a different yeah. conversation with the seller than if you have all the time in the world and you just inherited grandma's house and stacked right. full of six feet of stuff. So they'll say, well, I could just list it and sell it. Your foreclosure is in five days. It's not going to happen. Here's your options. So depending on the seller, we'll have a reality bill talk with them and get a little uh, aggressive on explaining what the actual options are. So then let's bring it to the actual distress. So listing, obviously always an option. If time frame isn't a consideration, but maybe less hassle is a consideration, then yeah. novations are, are going to net them the second best amount. And that's effectively, we list the property and we collect a novation fee from the seller as opposed to a wholesale fee from a buyer. And we've done a handful of those. And for the right seller, it fits their model really well because they can list on the MLS. We can do some repairs to the property for them if we need to or want to, so they're not out of pocket. And everything settles at closing. So that's very good. There's obviously the traditional cash, which yeah. to be honest, we like because it's the most straightforward and the cleanest. And key to that is don't lie. If you don't need an option, don't put an option on the contract because if you're up against me and right. your contract says 25-day option for $5 and mine says... $5,000 option for zero to zero day option, $5,000 earnest money. I'm going to win. Right. And I know that because we see other people's contracts. So there's the cash sale. That's what, that's the options basically that the sellers have. From there, we have all kinds of dispo strategies. So yeah. innovation is obviously a dispo strategy simultaneous with acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Listing is a dispo strategy simultaneous with acquisitions. Wholesale is a dispo strategy technically simultaneous with acquisitions, I suppose, in terms of timeline, but right. without the seller involvement. And then there's traditional wholesales. So sell them as is without doing anything to them after we close them. We do a lot of seller finance. So we'll put it on the market or we'll market it to our kind of internal buyers list and we'll sell it as is with seller financing where we're the bank. And we'll do flips. Uh, I would say two years ago, we were probably 75% flips. Right now we're probably about 25% flips yeah. because of just the change in the marketplace and our increased volume in terms of just what we're able to do. Those are kind of all the different options, I think. I'm sure I'm missing yeah, one think, or two. But that's I think that's good enough for now, man, because that's a lot of <laughs> options right there. So it's, yeah. it's good. It's good. I think the reason I asked that question is because 
I'm always interested in giving people a full picture, right? Because they need to have a full picture. They may not be able to appreciate that yet, but they, just the complexity of navigating a simple lead that picked up a phone and called you or clicked on your ad or whatever they did, the complexity in the situation is so high, it's not as easy as I'm going to go buy a for pre-foreclosure property. Which really comes to the second question is, and the next question really is more around, if somebody were to do this today, they were to launch themselves into doing what you're trying to do, mm. how would they approach that? What would they need to do? What kind of teams would they need to have? Of course, I don't think they would want to compete with someone like you because they can't. Not at least yet. Maybe uh, have not, some, not, day one. not day one, maybe day 10, maybe day 20, but not on day one, right? What would your recommendation be for somebody who has tried their arms into this and see if this is something for them, if not for full time, maybe for side money? It really depends on what their goals are in terms of what their objective is. Do they want to make it a full-time thing? Do they have money? Do they not have money to invest? Do they want to do a volume business? Do they want to do a margin-based business? And it's really going to come from that aspect. And then it's going to come, again, step two is probably what are they capable of doing? If you're broke and have no money, then you really only have one of probably two or three options. You just either partner with someone that isn't broke and does have money and prove yourself mm -hmm. to them. And you do that one of probably two ways. You either become an employee and uh, we have some kids here that make a lot of money and they're really good at a binary task and they learn the business inside and out. It's not sexy because you're yeah. not making 100% of the deal, but you're still making really good money and you're doing it relatively quickly. If you want to do it all your own because everyone thinks they want to be an entrepreneur and I really don't like that phrase to be honest with you because I think entrepreneurs create and I'm not interested in creating. I'm interested in figuring out what's working in the marketplace and then figuring out how to do it that much better than the next guy. Of and course. there's an entrepreneurial yeah. spirit. But right. effectively, we're a small business. We're not innovators in the marketplace to that extent. If you had no money and want to do it all on your own, go buy a distressed list, knock on doors, go driving for dollars, look for shaggy stuff in crappy neighborhoods, in secondary markets, because you're going to be very competitive in a big metro area. Yeah. Get a list of buyers or get a list of sellers. And then you find people like us by clicking on our ad. We have wholesalers that click on our ads and it used to piss me off. And now we just turn them into like actual repeat sellers. And then people like us acquire the property. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. One thing that's interesting, you mentioned, I don't want to compete with us day one. You definitely don't. But if you're in a single exit strategy marketplace, so just wholesaling or even just flipping, it's a very fragile business model where the barriers to entry are relatively low. The people that are doing it well are, there's not that many of them. And they're susceptible to market changes very quickly, mm -hmm. more so almost than if you're willing to take down a property and then look at different exit strategies based on the property. Now, obviously, there's associated risk with that. Yeah. But if the market changes and you can buy stuff at 70% on the MLS, which that's an extreme example, but I was doing it in California in the crash, then wholesaling business is very much more difficult to pursue. And the other problem is, the other reason it's fragile, is if you're locked into one exit strategy, you're losing out on so many different options in terms of how right. you, you can make money. The average wholesale fee nationwide is probably about $20,000, more or less. And the average return on their ad spend is probably a three to four to maybe five X multiple. So they're paying 20 to 30% in direct marketing expense to get a deal. Now try right. scaling that up and you can do it, but it becomes more difficult. So the best way to increase your margin is to learn how to negotiate better, learn what sellers want, and then learn how to employ additional exit strategies aside from just the wholesaling exit strategy. Yeah. And then when you launched yourself into this business, how did you do? How do you learn about all this stuff? This is just learn by doing it. Oh yeah. No, I made all the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, this is all experience. I made all the mistakes. No, I've never had a mentor. That's probably to my detriment. I've had a lot of people that pointed me the right direction at the right time, and I'm very grateful for that. I have a lot of friends in the business that have done that in the past, and some that we've lapped, and some that are still quite a bit farther ahead than we are. And I'm, right. I'm very grateful for those relationships. I think it comes back to the beginning of the conversation. It's, it's all about the people. If you want yeah. to do 100 deals your first year, good luck. But if you want to do 100 deals year two, then find the people that are doing 300 deals and figure out what they're doing and figure out how yeah. they're doing it. That's a key, right? With anything in life, not just with this deal. I think it's more if you want to do something strategically, not just happenstance. If you want to do something strategically, Absolutely. you want to learn from somebody who's already done that. Unless you're the, the Google and the Airbnbs of the world where they're trying to do something which nobody has done. Most of us are not there. And if you are, yeah. great. You should definitely do that. But if you already know you don't want to be there, I don't want to put the effort of that and take the risk on it. 
when you just partner with mm. somebody, look at somebody who has done that before, add some more value to them. And like you're talking about, right? Employee. People look at it, like, I want to do this deal myself. You can, but you may have to, there's a time to learn and there's time to earn. And you have to realize, mm. I think as an individual, is it your time to earn or is it time to learn? Most of us want to earn very fast without really trying to learn. That's where the detriment, it works against them. I think that's what you're basically trying to tell them as well in this messaging that work with somebody, partner with somebody, emulate somebody who's already there. And then maybe you'll get yeah. there one day, right? Not maybe, you'll Those probably get there one day. If you have the work ethic and the determination and the follow through to do it and the open mindedness, I think probably my biggest, my biggest issues are probably not asking for help more than I have in the past, like not yeah. reaching out and talking to people that are doing better than me. Now, is that arrogance? Is that I know more than them about other stuff anyway, so what could they know more than I do about yeah. this one thing? Well, sometimes one thing is all it takes to change the entire just uh, trajectory so, TJ, of your life. What really. changed that behavior? Why did you start asking for uh, help? What changed in your life that shifted your mindset? Yeah, I think you got to know who to ask is a good piece of it. If you're doing... Yeah, if you're 25 and you have 200 units under your belt, that's a different business yeah. model and a different perspective than real estate, than residential distressed flipping. So it's, it's very right. different in terms of knowing like, okay, let's figure out who to actually ask the, those questions to, as opposed to department questions to. Yeah, I love this, TJ. I think there's so much insights you've dropped into this less than 30 minutes conversation. This is amazing. I want to be respectful of your Appreciate time it. here. TJ, we're coming towards the end of our show here. I think the question that I really want to lead with is, Let's go back to when you were 20, 24, 25. What insight would you give it to that person now? Knowing what you know now about life, about wealth, about the journey, your journey to wealth, what's one insight, mindset shifting insight would you give it to them? Take action. If you don't fail, no one's ever going to respect you. But take action. Mm. Work your ass off. It doesn't matter what the market's doing because someone's making money in the market doing something. So figure out right. what that is. If you want to do that, do it and do it with everything you have. It's not about learning. Everyone has learning experiences. Everyone has liked college, didn't like college, didn't go, whatever. None of that matters. At the age of 24, 25, none of that matters. All that matters is take action and go out there and do it. Find a direction and start going. Yeah. I see too many people with analysis paralysis thinking yeah. about it or wanting to and don't want to have the work ethic or the determination to actually go out and do it. I love that one. You can use it at any age, not just now. Because I see a lot of my friends still in the analysis paralysis. I remember mm -hmm. my first deal when I was presenting them. Hey, do you want to invest in my apartment? They're like, I want to do it myself. That was five years ago. They haven't bought a single deal. <laughs> uh, and yeah. I've since pivoted from multiple different asset classes, including multifamily, right? At some point, you have to understand, is 2% of the bigger pie better or 100% of 0% is much better for you, right? And you have to understand oh, that. Oh, absolutely. You have to understand yeah. Your own mentality. Same thing with scaling a company. Once you have employees and yeah, that's overhead, that's expenses. But if they're allowing you to buy back your time, what they make doesn't matter. It Correct. matters to them, but it shouldn't matter to the business if the business is solid yeah. and stable. Correct. Last question, TJ, before we wrap this up. If you had a wish and desire, and if you were given the power to do that, what's your one wish and desire for the humanity as a whole to migrate towards? Stop worrying so much about what everyone else thinks about you. Mm, man, that's think, powerful. That is powerful. Because I think that bumps into a lot of the social issues, a lot of the race, gender, all the stuff, whatever it is. If sticks and stones really hurt and words don't, then I think the world's probably a little bit better place. So worry a lot more about what people do and not so much about what they say. Take what they say as a reflection of maybe who they are. But, you know, that's them. That's not you. TJ, I love that one, man. I don't think anyone has ever shared that one on this show. So I'm going to use it. So thank you again for saying that and sharing your key insights here. TJ, I loved having this conversation. You're one of the few guests where we were able to get a lot of actionable insights in a very short time frame. So thank you for being very, very thoughtful in your answers. If people were to Absolutely. get in touch with you, they were trying to see what you do and maybe click on your, hopefully they don't click on your ad just to test it out. We don't want to increase your ad budget. Where can they find you? They'll have a hard time finding the ads. They're on, under a bunch of different pages. TJCozen.com because I'm super creative. TJ Cozen on Facebook and Instagram. I've actually bought deals from people sending them to me on Instagram. So that's kind of cool. We have a kind of education website that also has all of our deals on it, which is REI AF. REI is real estate investing. AF just sounded fancy. So I put it up there. And we're all over the internet. Super easy to get a hold of. Absolutely. 
Awesome. Well, we'll make sure we include all the information in the show notes below. But thank you again, TJ, for taking the time, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Cheers, man. If you got value from this episode, you might consider sharing this content with a friend. But most importantly, be sure to take action on what you've learned. One way you can take the next step is to connect directly with Socket on an investor call. That link is waiting for you in the show notes below. The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Please consult your own advisors when making any investment decisions. Keep listening. We'll see you on the next episode.